Adela, go ahead. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Adela Pineda Franco. I am the director of the Teresa Lozano Long Institute of Latin American Studies. And I welcome you all to this uh, panel titled Reproductive Rights in the Americas and Historical Perspective. I thank you very much, my colleague Paloma Diaz, who organized this event and that has uh, amazing speakers who will be introduced by Elizabeth O'Brien. Um, Elizabeth is our alumna, and I thank her greatly for, for accepting our invitation to moderate the panel. We consider this topic of utmost importance to present a comparative and overall perspective of this um, very contemporary topic. So let me introduce Elizabeth. Elizabeth is currently an assistant professor of the history of medicine at John Hopkins University. Her research and teaching interweave the history of medicine and social and cultural history in order to examine themes of gender, race, religion, empire, and nation in the production of medical knowledge. Her research has been funded by several foundations. Uh, she's been very uh, successful with, uh, with, with grant funding from American Council of Learned Societies, the Andrew Mellon Foundation, the National Science Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Comexus Fulbright Program, the Tinker Foundation, the American Historical Association, and the History of Science Society. She has published in several journals, um, and she has a very interesting book project, which is based on her 2019 doctoral dissertation titled Intimate Interventions, the Cultural Politics of Reproductive Survey in Mexico. And she's covering a very wide span from 1790, I guess, the French Revolution, to 1940. Uh, so thank you very much, Elizabeth, and welcome, everybody. Thank you so much, um, Dr. De La Pineda. Um, hello, everyone, and good afternoon. My, um, my, my biggest thanks to Lila Spenson for making this event happen, to Paloma Diaz for her tireless efforts to organize everything and um, line up such a great panel of speakers today, and especially to Doctora de la Pineda Franco for that kind introduction and for her support of these conversations. I think these dialogues about reproductive rights have not always centered Latin American and Latinx perspectives and realities. And so I'm thrilled that this will be the focus of today's conversation, especially given that the last few years have seen monumental changes in reproductive rights policies in countries across the Americas. I'll begin by introducing our esteemed panelists with a note that there's so much that I could say about the honors and publications and awards and research agendas of each, but I've been asked to keep the introduction short so that we can leave more time for a discussion. Doctora Ana Cristina Gonzalez Vélez is a professor of health law at La Universidad de los Andes and is founder of the Right to Decide in Colombia, as well as co-founder of La Mesa por la Vida y la Salud de las Mujeres. Thank you so much, Dr. Ana Cristina Gonzalez Velez, for joining us today. Dr. Carrie White is an associate professor in UT Austin's Steve Hicks School of Social Work. And I'm very, very excited to hear about all of her um, research today. I'll note that Dr. Carrie White has to leave a little bit before the other panelists after about 30 minutes of discussion. And so we'll prioritize hearing her voice first. Dr. Cassia Roth is associate professor, congratulations on um, having achieved tenure in history and Latin American and Caribbean studies at the University of Georgia. Um, and her book is A Miscarriage of Justice. It's about the history of reproduction in Brazil. Dr. Lauren Thaxton, MD, is an obstetrician gynecologist and assistant professor of medicine with the Dell Medical School Department of Women's Health. So thank you so much for bringing that perspective for us today. Our first discussion point and question um, is to just begin by asking everyone to comment on the major areas of hope, encouragement, or even progress that you have seen in terms of access to reproductive rights and high quality reproductive health care 
in the particular country or geographic order that you study, as well as the main obstacles that you see for such active access in that location. We'll hear first from Dr. Carrie White. So I'll mute myself while you talk. Thank you so much for that introduction and, and getting us off to such a great start, Elizabeth. Um, in the United States, I think we have seen the development of several different options for obtaining pills for medication abortion um, that do not require people to go to a brick and mortar health center in order to end their pregnancy and do so safely. And some of these models for providing these medications really took off following the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. And there was also a great amount of evidence around the safety of using these different models for getting medications to pregnant people that wanted to end their pregnancies. And there's been recognition from the Food and Drug Administration that these models are very safe for um, people to use, um, particularly the use of telemedicine or um, communicating with a clinician via video conference or asynchronously um, about when it is appropriate to take the medications and the steps one needs to follow to do so. So that has really expanded safe access to abortion for many people in the United States. Um, but unfortunately, there are still many states in the US that prohibit the use of telemedicine specifically for medication abortion. And this was even before the United States Supreme Court issued its decision this last summer overturning the federal protections around abortion um, in its decision in the Jackson Women's Health um, Organization case. Um, and of course, overturning Roe versus Wade in the United States and also criminalizing the provision of abortion care in many states, including where we are in Texas, has been a monumental setback for reproductive rights in the US. There are still people who will need abortion care, um, who will decide to take um, and, and be able to take advantage of some of these options like buying medication abortion pills over the internet or even using telemedicine models if they're able um, or even getting medications from Mexico to end their own pregnancy, um, regardless of what Texas law says. But this isn't a method that is going to work for all people. And there are also going to be incredible obstacles for those who need abortion care who are unable to get it in their home state if they need to travel um, and pay for care where abortion remains legal. And so it is going to be very difficult for people to take multiple days off of work, to lose wages from their job, to make arrangements for their caregiving responsibilities. Um, and this will force many people to continue their pregnancies. And I think Dr. Thaxton will be able to speak more specifically about some of the clinical implications of that. Thanks so much, Dr. White. Um, Dr. Gonzalez Vélez, uh, if we could hear from you next, that'd be wonderful. Yes, let me change, switch the Spanish channel. Eh, bueno, eh, muchas gracias por esta invitación. Eh, debido a las limitaciones de tiempo y para que podamos tener después algunas preguntas, yo voy a enfocarme sobre todo en Colombia con algunas referencias generales a América Latina. Yo quisiera destacar en términos del progreso en nuestra región y en, y en particular en Colombia, yo destacaría dos elementos. El primero es el marco de política pública. Tenemos una política nacional desde el año 2003, una política que es integral y que considera distintas áreas y, e incluso ha sido actualizada recientemente. Pero además hemos incluido las prestaciones de salud sexual y reproductiva en lo que se conoce como el paquete básico de atención en el contexto del sistema de salud, incluidas las prestaciones de aborto desde el año 2006, cuando se despenalizó por primera vez este servicio en Colombia, por mencionar dos elementos grandes para la conversación. Eh, por supuesto que hay obstáculos importantes, yo quisiera destacar dos relacionados con las desigualdades que son además obstáculos expresivos en América Latina, las desigualdades que se expresan en los resultados de los principales indicadores de salud reproductiva y también en las barreras de acceso que enfrentan las mujeres, 
es decir, in, desigualdades estructurales como la pobreza, la etnia, la raza, el nivel educativo, que están vinculados a resultados más pobres eh, de salud reproductiva en muchos indicadores, pero también obviamente a dis, diferencias, digamos, en la posibilidad de acceso y que a su vez profundizan eh, las desigualdades estructurales y en esa misma línea estas desigualdades que han sido agravadas durante el COVID tanto en Colombia como en otros países de la región solamente para que se hagan una idea por ejemplo la mortalidad materna en Colombia aumentó a nivel nacional 40% entre el año 2020 y el 2021 pero cuando miramos esas cifras en las menores de las niñas de 10 a 14 años es hasta el aumento es del 125% o la reducción en el acceso a métodos anticonceptivos fue del 28%, pero sube hasta un 40% para las mujeres de menos de 19 años. Es decir, vimos cambios muy importantes en materia de desigualdades que fueron agravadas por el covid y quisiera terminar con un aspecto muy importante y son los cambios eh, recientes en materia de aborto en varios países de la región, como Argentina, como México y en particular en Colombia, donde logramos que el aborto fuera despenalizado hasta la semana 24 por cualquier razón y después de la semana 24 se mantiene despenalizado bajo tres excepciones sin límite de edad gestacional. Y me gustaría explicar por qué eh, empezamos a buscar un cambio en el marco regulatorio que en Colombia eh, había sido completamente prohibido el aborto hasta el año 2006 cuando la Corte Constitucional creó el modelo de causales y lo, liberó, lo liberalizó por primera vez. Lo que sucedía es que la mayoría de los abortos seguían siendo ilegales, no más del 10% ocurrían en los sistemas de salud, la morbilidad y la mortalidad se concentraban en algunos grupos, pero también la persecución criminal, es decir, las mujeres más jóvenes, las mujeres rurales, las más pobres, de nuevo todas esas diferencias entre grupos de mujeres se expresaban en el acceso y en la criminalización y además las mujeres enfrentaban barreras relacionadas, por ejemplo, con la interpretación del marco legal, con la falta de conocimiento sobre el marco legal entre mujeres y prestadoras, fallas en la prestación de los servicios incluidas, por ejemplo, la falta de protocolos sanitarios o la objeción de conciencia. Entonces, a partir de nuestro trabajo, en particular desde la Mesa por la Vida y la Salud de las Mujeres y desde una serie de estudios que hicimos, entendimos que el delito de aborto opera como la barrera estructural que está en la base de la mayoría de las barreras que las mujeres enfrentan cuando buscan acceder a un servicio de aborto. Y en ese momento es que decidimos transformar el debate en Colombia y pelear para que ese delito fuera eliminado del Código Penal. Yo más tarde lo voy a explicar en la conversación, pero lo que quería enfatizar en este quinto elemento que resalté, y repito muy brevemente, las políticas, el paquete de prestaciones, las desigualdades, las desigualdades agravadas por el COVID y el aborto, lo que quería destacar acá es que hicimos una evaluación a partir de la información que teníamos de cómo había sido la, la implementación y el acceso a los servicios de aborto bajo ese régimen de indicaciones que fue válido hasta febrero de este año y esa evaluación nos llevó a empujar este cambio en la regulación, una regulación que entendíamos que no era suficiente, que no había suficiente acceso a servicios de calidad y que por tanto se estaba afectando la protección de los derechos reproductivos. Esa decisión que tomamos fue abrir una conversación pública para explicar por qué y de qué manera el delito de aborto era injusto, contraproducente, ineficiente y discriminatorio, una conversación en nuestros propios términos que iniciamos aún antes de ir adelante con la demanda legal que espero explicar un poco más adelante. Well, Dr. Um, Carrie White and Dr. Gonzalez Vélez have already given us so much, a whole panorama of information um, about legal and um, structural and other changes, uh, hopeful and also challenges. Um, and so now we'll turn to Dr. Thaxton, who is going to comment a little bit on um, the medical realities um, and whatever else she would like to comment on um, for her turn here. I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Thaxton. Thank you, and thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate being part of this discussion. Um, I think one of the main things in the United States that distinguishes 2022 um, 
from 1972 is our phones um, and uh, the internet. And I think that that's kind of uh, changed the way that people access information for both good and bad. I think that um, increasingly, as Dr. White already talked about, people are turning to the internet as a resource um, for information about abortion, for information about how to access abortion. We see that in Texas currently. Um, and so I think that that um, is able to reach a wider audience. And I also think it can be used as a platform where people who have had abortions have the opportunity to speak up and talk about their abortions. And I think that that has created an avenue for destigmatization of abortion. On the other hand, I also think that um, because of the breadth of information that is out there, I think that it's really hard to be able to distinguish what's good information from bad information. Um, I also think that these same avenues have been already discussed as potential avenues for criminalization of abortion and, and for um, tracking folks, um, and that is of concern. Um, and lastly, as Dr. White mentioned, um, you know, there are, as a physician, I can say that there are really complex medical conditions that do require medical decision making that, you know, is patients that are best served by seeing um, someone who has been through medical school or has had a, um, training in abortion. And, um, and so though the condition, people with those conditions um, we see already in the United States and places where abortion has been criminalized um, that, <clears throat> excuse me, that those are pregnancies with delayed care. Um, and in that interim, sick patients are getting sicker. Um, and so that I think is a big concern as well. Thanks so much for that, Dr. Thaxton. Um, next, we have Cassia Roth, who not only has expertise in um, the state of this question in Brazil, but also from a historical perspective. Go ahead, Cassia. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, and um, to everyone else um, for your comments so far. I just want to no note that there is a question in the Q&A Q that I think some moderation needs to occur. Um, but I'm going to just speak a little bit briefly uh, from a historical perspective. I am a historian. I studied history of abortion and reproductive health in Brazil. Um, but in Brazil, it's one country in Latin America where abortion continues to uh, remains criminalized. So it's criminalized in all cases except um, in cases of rape, a threat to the mother's life. And then since 2012, fetal anencephaly, uh, which is a fatal birth defect where um, the fetus uh, does not develop large portions of the brain and skull and cannot live um, outside the womb. Um, the current laws are dating back to um, 1940 when that penal code was passed that still regulates abortion access today. Um, so, you know, briefly in the second half of the 20th century, um, there wasn't much agitation, political agitation um, or lobbying to uh, decriminalize abortion. Uh, in, the, in the mid 1970s, however, um, a second wave feminist movement in Brazil started advocating for abortion as a question of public health, as a fundamental human right, and as a matter of sexual and reproductive self determination. And this was important because in the 1980s, Brazil transitioned from a military dictatorship to a democratic government. Um, so they, Brazil was under a military dictatorship from 1964 to 1985. And during this transition, feminists lobbied to include abortion as a constitutional right in the lead up to the new constitution of 1988. Um, and the religious right countered this lobby by uh, putting forth a proposal uh, that life began at the moment of conception in the constitution. So both groups withdrew their proposals um, to, as a as a political compromise. And 
the reason I'm bringing this up is because the religious right is very powerful and very organized in Brazil, and it has only increased since the transition to democracy um, in the 1980s. Um, it's not only the Catholic lobby, but now an increasingly evangelical lobby, which has a lot of political power and a lot of elected officials. Uh, so one feminist that I uh, interviewed with my colleague said, you know, that the 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 religious right has been uh, transformed from being outside of the state to being the state itself in Brazil. Um, so that being said, there have been some, um, pro there has, progress has been made. Um, in 1988, the constitution uh, codified health as a human right in Brazil, um, which has been implemented through the, um, uh, a universal healthcare system called SUS. Um, and under that system, uh, especially in the early 2000s under the presidential governments of Lula and then Dilma um, from 2003 to 2016, um, provisions for or the regulations of legal abortion, so in cases of rape, threat to the mother's life, et cetera, were expanded and clarified. So it was easier to access um, legal abortions within the, within the public health care system. Since the election of uh, Jair Bolsonaro in 2018, some of those provisions have been rolled back um, and there have been many uh, sort of sensational cases of young girls um, who were victims of rape, often incest, who were unable to um, access abortion care even though they had the constitutional right or the legal right to do so. Um, so moving forward, Brazil has a presidential election this year and the previous um, left-wing workers Party uh, President Lula Inácio da Silva, who I mentioned briefly, um, is leading in the polls. But it's hard to understand what's going to happen in relation to abortion rights because in the past, the um, PT, the Workers' Party, of which he was the head, has sort of shied away from uh, efforts at decriminalization and have put their attention toward expanding regulatory uh, frameworks for abortion that is already legal. Um, and it's a very hot topic issue in Brazil with most people, uh, uh, the public in polls, not supporting decriminalization. Um, so the majority do not support full decriminalization, um, but the majority do uh, support having provisions in the law to allow for abortion in the cases of medical necessity, whether that's rape, incest, um, threat to the mother's life. So I'll leave it there um, for sort of the recent history of Brazil and what we have looking forward to this and during the presidential election. Thank you. That's all very helpful, Dr. Roth. Thanks so much. Um, so I am not going to answer this question for the sake at this moment for the sake of time. Um, I'm going to to pivot back to Dr. Carrie White before she has to leave. I wanted to ask her about her research um, more specifically. Dr. White, you've published a lot about the impact of reproductive health legislation on family planning clinic services um, in Texas and Alabama and elsewhere, um, as well as shifts in county public health service use, especially following changes in immigration law. So I wanted to invite you to talk more, or reflect more um, with us on what the major barriers that immigrants face um, in this country in accessing contraception and high quality reproductive health services in the United States. I was wondering, are there particular barriers in the US South um, that you wanted to let us know about? And also has the pandemic shifted this landscape at all? And if so, how? Yes, there are barriers to getting reproductive health care in the United States um, that are particularly pronounced for um, immigrants. And I would say just big picture, one thing is that we have an incredibly complicated healthcare system in the United States that is very difficult to navigate, even for people who were born and raised in this country. Um, for people who are you know, coming from a, a different country, who are familiar with different healthcare systems, it's really hard to figure out where services are available, where you can get care, and how you pay for that care. And one thing that makes it very difficult for immigrants and particularly immigrants living in many states in the US South, but not exclusively the US South, is that many of these states have made decisions to not include 
um, unauthorized immigrants or immigrants who have not been in the United States for a certain period of time in the insurance program that would cover contraception and pregnancy related care um, for those populations. So what this means is that um, people will need to pay out of pocket or rely on safety net services like at county health departments or other um, organizations that receive funding to provide care to primarily people living on low incomes, but also immigrant populations specifically. But again, these are really underfunded. So what this means is that people may not have access to the same broad scope of services that someone who is covered by insurance may have. Um, so just to provide a couple points of contrast, um, Texas is one of those states that does not include um, or does not allow um, unauthorized migrants or um, migrants or immigrants who have been living in the United States for less than five years to qualify for um, programs that would cover contraception for people living on low incomes and for um, people who are pregnant. There is a special program for um, pregnant um, non-legal residents in Texas, but it only includes a very limited number of pregnancy-related services that are really related to covering care for um, the fetus and not necessarily inclusive of all of the care a pregnant person might need. Um, so that really limits the, again, the scope of care um, that people can receive. Um, in contrast, a state like California has a very generous program of benefits um, for people who are residents of the state, regardless of their immigration status. And that allows um, people to get contraception at no cost, to um, get pregnancy-related care, delivery, and um, postpartum care in ways that are not possible for people in Texas um, or many of the other states that have such limitations on immigrant participation in programs. Um, I think another point um, to mention is that, you know, certainly um, in states, um, in some states in the U.S. South where there has not historically been a big um, immigrant population and specifically a non-English language speaking immigrant population, there is a dearth of um, language appropriate services for folks. So there may not be robust translation and interpretation services. Um, there may not be healthcare staff that speak someone's um, native language. And so this can really also compromise the quality of care um, for people who are non, um, who do not have English as their preferred language for um, accessing healthcare. I think another point that's really important to mention um, in a place like Texas and some of these other states that border Mexico, like um, Arizona, um, that have um, not always been so welcoming to immigrant populations is the, um, the US immigration policy. It doesn't necessarily have anything to do with healthcare per se, but really focused on um, building up the border. This is always, um, and, and really militarizing the border. This has been something that the US has done for quite a long time and, and certainly um, increased um, during the administration of President Trump. Um, so this makes it difficult for communities to cross into Mexico um, and return to the United States for um, health care, which may be available at lower cost, for medications that they can obtain over the counter without a prescription that is not possible for them in the United States. And so this does make it difficult for people to find other ways of accessing care. Um, what I think is also notable is that, um, at least I can speak just for Texas, is that there are also these interior border checkpoints. So um, checkpoints that are within 100 miles north of the border with Mexico um, that people need to pass through um, as they are traversing um, Texas, um, either to go to other cities in Texas or to travel out of the state to a state like New Mexico. Um, so these are staffed by immigration and customs officials. There are dogs that are sniffing cars. Um, and it can be a very intimidating um, point by which people need to pass through. 
So certainly if someone is unauthorized, they may be hesitant to cross these checkpoints. If they are traveling with a family member who um, lacks appropriate documentation, or simply because they are afraid of being harassed by immigration and customs officials, this really narrows the geographic boundaries around which people can navigate. And so just you know, before I wrap up here, for um, in a situation where someone may need um, reproductive health care that is not available in their community, and particularly abortion care, this really constrains access. Um, people may have to cross these border checkpoints to get to New Mexico. Um, they may be unwilling or unable to do so without putting themselves and their family at risk. Um, and they may be hesitant to cross into Mexico um, in order to um, you know, obtain medications um, that would allow them to end their pregnancy. So this really, really narrows the reproductive health care options um, for those populations. Dr. White, thank you so much. I know you have to leave, but um, I just wanted um, to take my hat off to you for laying out all of those barriers and explaining them um, within their context um, so compellingly. So um, I will probably say goodbye to you at this point, but thank you again, though. It was an honor, and I hope to see you, to meet you in person someday. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for your work. Um, now we wanted um, to stick with this, this, this question about contemporary access barriers, um, the social, economic, um, legal, and um, medical context around all of those things, and shift to uh, Colombia, where um, Dr. Gonzalez Vélez was already uh, starting to explain not only the recent activism, um, that's been happening there to decriminalize um, abortion procedures, but uh, also some of the, the complications and barriers that have come with that um, and with access, especially in the last couple of years. So again, Dr. Gonzalez Vélez, enormous congratulations to you. I know you've been fighting um, for these changes and you've been engaging in this activism and in the struggle for decades in order to lead to this moment of this wave of decriminalizations and changes in legislation in uh, several countries in Latin America. And um, I'm very interested in any light that you might want to shed on an argument that I've seen in the literature on forced childbearing, forced maternity, and obstetric violence, which is that the denial of abortion access, this is, this is what I've seen a lot of Latin American feminists um, and especially legal activists argue. They've argued that the, the denial of access to abortion constitutes a kind of violence against women and childbearing people and a violation of their dignity of entire groups of people as a whole. Um, and in the United States, some activists, especially those coming from the reproductive justice tradition, have referred to this as forced childbearing and have analyzed, you know, like the structural conditions of violence um, around um, these issues. And so I'm wondering if you can expand on your work on this topic. I also invite you to follow up on the um, the topics that you already uh um, I can only think of them in Spanish, you know, que um, estaba sembrando las semillas de unos temas de discusión hace rato. So you were, you were planting the seeds of many um, themes of discussion, and so you're invited to follow up on those as well. But I've also seen that you've just published a book about the concept of biolegitimidad in relation to abortion, um, to reproduction, reproductive rights. And so I was wondering if you could explain to the audience why you think that we should be be um, thinking with this concept of biolegitimidad in relation to reproductive health care and tell us about your book if you'd like to. Thank you. Well, that that's the most complicated maybe concept I've 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 used. I don't know, but I'm listening to myself. So give me one second because something is happening. Uh, Maybe because you're presenting in English, did you choose the English channel to speak or your interpretation? Voy a, voy a presentar en español. Ay, yo elegí español porque voy a presentar en español. ¿Estamos? ¿Me escuchan? Is correct? Okay. 
Bueno, decía que, que, que este es uno de los conceptos más complicados, pero voy a tratar de, de, de explicar de manera muy sencilla un par de cosas que me parecen importantes para contribuir a la conversación. Como ya había mencionado en mi respuesta anterior, en el año 2020 nosotros lanzamos el movimiento Causa Justa para promover una conversación pública nacional orientada a explicar a distintos sectores de la sociedad y, a, y usando distintas herramientas y estrategias por qué el delito de aborto es un delito injusto, contraproducente, ineficaz y discriminatorio. Y por qué teníamos, eh, por qué habíamos hecho, eh, por qué estábamos haciendo esfuerzos para eliminar ese delito del Código Penal. En otras palabras, ¿por qué considerábamos que era necesario hacer un cambio en el paradigma con que se, venía, se viene regulando el aborto en el mundo entero, abandonando el uso del derecho penal y regulándolo desde regulaciones eh, sanitarias? Con ese objetivo, nosotras trabajamos 90 argumentos que ustedes pueden consultar en la página web de Causa Justa, eh, argumentos desde distintas perspectivas, de manera que mucha más gente se pudiera involucrar en la conversación de acuerdo a sus intereses, a sus experiencias, a su conocimiento o incluso de acuerdo a aquello que les conmoviera más desde el punto de vista argumental. Dentro de esos argumentos, algunos estaban relacionados con el marco internacional de derechos humanos o con la perspectiva de salud pública, con la bioética, con la democracia, etcétera. Y una de, los, eh, as, de las cosas más fuertes que nosotras dijimos durante toda esa, public, esa conversación pública que empezó en febrero del año 2020, seis meses antes de que presentáramos la demanda ante la Corte Constitucional, era que todos los embarazos deberían ser planeados y deseados. De esta manera, el Estado no puede forzar a ninguna mujer a convertirse en madre como tampoco le puede prohibir a ninguna mujer la decisión de serlo. En tanto, esa es una decisión sustancial para el proyecto de vida de, de cualquier mujer, eh, lo que desde una perspectiva de la biolegitimidad es conocido como la dimensión biográfica de la vida. La vida de los seres humanos, y esto lo sabemos desde Aristóteles, tiene dos dimensiones, una dimensión biológica, que es la dimensión que en general se reconoce y protege en las políticas públicas en salud reproductiva, pero sobre todo en materia de aborto, pero la dimensión biográfica es una dimensión como subordinada. Eh, nosotros lo que explicamos fue de qué manera las regulaciones restrictivas sobre aborto, siendo las más restrictivas de todas las que penalizan completamente el aborto, pero en general el delito de aborto, lo que explicamos era de qué forma esas regulaciones estaban informadas por una menor legitimidad que se otorgaba a la vida de las mujeres, en especial una menor legitimidad que se otorga a la dimensión biográfica de sus vidas, en, en tanto las mujeres usualmente pueden acceder a un aborto si su, por ejemplo, salud está en riesgo, pero no porque haya decidido no continuar el embarazo por cualquier otra razón. De esta manera, esa menor legitimidad al final informa las políticas y las leyes que son centrales para asegurar o negar el acceso a los servicios de salud reproductiva y a la información de salud reproductiva. Esta es una idea muy compleja, pero el punto es que eh, nosotros hemos dicho en, en voz alta que cuando a través de las políticas o las leyes les impedimos a las mujeres tomar decisiones basadas en sus propias razones, no estamos dando legitimidad a sus vidas y de esta manera estamos negando también su libertad de conciencia, entre otros derechos. Y es, digamos, una perspectiva distinta para abordar el problema del que tú estabas hablando sobre la maternidad forzada o el embarazo forzado. Okay, thank you so much, doctora González Vélez. Um, we'll come back to you for in case you would like to keep uh, talking about, um, about the movement in Colombia and um, everything that you know has been going on and the barriers that you face and how you've been how, how you've been confronting them 
But um, for now, we'll go to doc, um, Dr. Thaxton, um, who has been doing a lot of research in this area and who um, has identified, among other things, um, some hesitancy by some pharmacists who did not support over-the-counter access to hormonal contraception. And so a specific question about that would be if you could comment on the struggles that you've encountered um, in terms of contraception access and barriers to its use in your medical practice. Um, and as a clinician, um, how do you confront those? And um, you know how, how do you also um, kind of take care of yourself in this process, you know, in this, this very complicated political context that we're working in? Um, and anything else that you would like to share um, about your, your, your research and approach to these issues? Thanks so much. Yeah, so for a little bit of context, that work was actually done in New Mexico, when I was in New Mexico, um, where we have a number of uh, really rural communities. Um, and so pharmacy, a pharmacy may be, you know, the nearest, for, for many people, um, a pharmacy is the nearest healthcare provider. Um, and so we, yes, ha looked into um, talking with rural pharmacists about their thoughts and feelings about over-the-counter access to contraception. And also I'll say on the um, positive side that we partnered with pharmacists in New Mexico that um, were really actively engaged in, in um, trying to expand the scope of practice um, in order to expand access um, and provide, you know, reproductive autonomy to the, the people in New Mexico. Um, many of those pharmacists were urban pharmacists. And so I think that there's a little bit uh, what we what we uncovered was a, this divide between access and reality um, and the lived experience of people and in particular the lived experiences of rural, rural communities. Um, and so so that was kind of the perspective um, in New Mexico. I think all of those same kind of barriers apply here in Texas as well, but then layered on top of it, everything that Dr. White talked about um, as far as um, the barriers to healthcare that exist um, in the U.S. healthcare system, but particularly in Texas, you know, Texas is one of the highest uninsured, I think it is the highest uninsured um, state um, for reproductively aged um, pregnancy capable people. Um, and so, you know, as a clinician, I see patients who experience barriers to contraception every day in my practice. And um, in particular barriers to care for um, highly effective contraception. So for example, IUDs, implants, and sterilization procedures. Um, the, um, so um, as, a, as a common kind of story, um, seeing a patient who is pregnant currently wants this to be their last pregnancy desire sterilization at the time of their delivery. But that patient, if they're funded by Medicaid for their delivery, needs to sign a federal consent form that must be signed at least 30 days before their delivery, but no longer than 180 days. So maybe they sign this form, maybe they don't. Maybe they experience from their healthcare provider that they are either too young or don't have enough children or provider biases um, about who should be sterilized or who shouldn't. Um, maybe they go to a different hospital for their delivery and that hospital may be religiously affiliated and therefore have um, directives that prohibit them from doing um, sterilization surgeries. Maybe that hospital simply does not want to, to do those procedures. Um, and then they leave the hospital. And for many people, especially in Texas with our disjointed system, shortly after they have delivered, they lose their mechanism of accessing healthcare because um, new opportunities for insurance open up whenever someone is pregnant that they then lose after delivery. 
Um, and so then again, they find themselves in a position of not being able to access that care. Um, so, so that's kind of the, the, um, the context that people um, experience all this disjointed um, care and, and, um, and we see discrepancies between what people want to be using to prevent pregnancy and what they are actually using to prevent pregnancy. Um, and so I think that there are, you know, many opportunities for confronting this, these barriers. I think one that we've kind of touched on several times now is having continuity of healthcare and recognizing that um, people who are pregnancy capable are also illness capable outside of pregnancy and that we should, should care about those um, patients and ensure those patients and take, uh, give them opportunities for healthcare outside of pregnancy. Um, so some efforts for that in the US are extending um, pregnancy Medicaid um, timelines um, and um, providing more opportunities for insurance, um, both on the local level and state level. Um, I think, um, you know, one thing that I personally am working on in my own work is leveraging mobile health as an opportunity to um, reconnect people back into um, clinics systems, which often have local mechanisms of um, providing care, um, particularly for contraception. So I think that there are opportunities, um, but I, I think that um, addressing some of the policies um, are also very important. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Thaxton. Um, maybe this follow-up question is, um, is slightly personal, but I work with a lot of aspiring MD students, and I was wondering if you had any kinds of words of wisdom or advice to those who are thinking about taking on careers in OBGYN, including um, if you have suggestions for areas of research or advocacy that are particularly underexplored or that you would encourage people to get into um, or anything that you wanted to share along those lines. Absolutely, and I'm so excited for your um you know folks going into medicine and particularly into OBGYN. I will just say that um you know yes it's a challenging time but my job is extraordinarily rewarding um it, for medical students in particular um i would really encourage them to work with medical students for choice which is a national um organization um which works with medical students um to provide opportunities for education and abortion and contraception that are often neglected in medical school curriculums um, I think that uh, one, um, how do I phrase this? One question that has come up very often for me in my own role from both medical students and residents is um, in thinking about where, where they should apply to programs, where they should um, uh, receive their education um, in OBGYN. Um, particularly as we look at this situation where um, about 41% of OBGYN residents are going to graduate um, in the next few years um, in locations where abortion is criminalized in the U.S. And so when you think about that generational impact, um, they will those residents are going to be less capable in seeing patients who have had abortions um, and also managing miscarriage and other first trimester pregnancy complications, which are all things that we teach. Um, and I think that um, it is, you know, my one liner that I give medical students that are in this quandary of should I apply for programs in Texas is learn in places where you can learn everything, practice in places where, you know, the people need you. Um, I think that um, it's really hard to learn in environments of fear. I think that it's really hard to learn where there are not opportunities for learning. Um, and so, um, so that would be my piece of advice for 
people pursuing a career in OBGYN. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's um, a weighty decision right now, it seems. Um, thank you for sharing that. Well, I wanted to shift to the historical context um, of these questions. So back to Dr. Roth, um, uh, speaking from a historical perspective and as the other historian in the room, I'm um, you know, looking forward to, to hearing you share. Uh, one of my questions for you was if you could explain to the audience why you choose to analyze the history of abortion and pregnancy termination in tandem with miscarriage and infanticide and medical neglect of impoverished women, especially in early 20th century, late 19th and early 20th century Brazil. Um, what led you to decide that all of these things needed to be examined together in conversation with each other and methodologically, like how do you do so, but what, also what are the challenges for that? Um, but most of all, I would really like you to reflect on why a historical perspective on all of these issues is necessary for our moment today and what specifically does a historical perspective add to this conversation on, on reproductive rights and lack thereof, as you refer to in your book as a miscarriage of justice. Had to unmute myself. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And I was busy writing things down that other people uh, were saying, the other panelists were saying. Um, and two things sort of caught my mind or caught my attention um, that Dr. Thaxton and Dr. Velez both said was um, the need for healthcare to be to have a continuity of healthcare, which is what uh, Dr. Thaxton said, and that the criminalization of abortion as a legal uh, um, tenant is ineffective, right? Ineficaz, which is what Dr. Velez said. So I'm going to sort of uh, provide a historical example of this, I think, and talk about um, the need to look at, at uh, historical variables and what has changed or hasn't changed over time. Um, but, you know, in sort of relation to the specific question of why do you want to, why do I look at all of these uh, practices or events together. I mean, we all know that abortion is not the only aspect um, that of a woman's reproductive health or a woman's reproductive life, right? That abortion, miscarriage, and in the 19th and early 20th centuries, infanticide um, could, could be all parts of a woman's reproductive experience. Um, and I am using the term woman in the historical sense that, you know, in the late, in the 19th and early 20th century, uh, most people who got pregnant and uh, had abortions were identified as women um, because gender terminology was different at the time. So I'm using sort of historical or historicized gender terminology. Um, but so when you're researching women's health and abortion, one of the first places that you look at are criminal records, right? Because if it was criminalized in the past, which it was in Brazil, then there should be some evidence of that criminalization in the courts. Um, and when I started looking at police investigations and court cases of abortion, I actually found that they were as much about pregnancy loss or stillbirth as they were about abortion or even infanticide. Um, and that's because the police force that was investigating these and the judges and lawyers who were trying them often conflated miscarriages and abortion and um, to the obvious detriment of the women who were under investigation. And we are seeing that this today um, as well. So this is, again, historical precedent that has continued into the present day. So I'm just going to give one example, a historical example, and sort of tease out um, uh, the, the aspects about uh, continuity of healthcare or the quality of healthcare and then legal tenants surrounding it. So um, when I was in the archive doing research for my first book, I, I came across this case. It's in 1912. There's a 29-year-old woman, her name is Gisalina Vieira, and she goes into labor. Um, so a female neighbor of hers accompanies her to the city. Uh, this is, excuse me, this is in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Uh, her female neighbor accompanies her to the nearby public maternity hospital, which is the first public maternity hospital in the city. Um, but when they got there, the, the, the uh, doorman turned them away and said there was actually no room and the physicians weren't going to allow the women to enter. So Vieta delivered her child on the sidewalk in the front of the hospital and it died minutes later. Um, 
you know, a, a municipal police officer comes and again asks um, that the women be admitted to the hospital and the physician again denies them access because there's no bed. Um, so an ambulance transports Vieira to another public hospital um, and the police and the friend take the um, infant to the city morgue, right? So you would think, okay, they would, they would issue a death certificate, which was in um, uh, line with regulations and go on their way. But the police, the supervising police officer actually opened an infanticide investigation into Vieira. Um, so she was illiterate um, and she was married, but had been separated from her husband for 12 years. So implying that the child she had just delivered was not his. Um, and that she declared that while the child was born alive, it fell to the sidewalk during the birth, uh, during which the umbilical cord ruptured. Um, and the supervising physician who testified in the case, ref uh, who refused Vieta's entry, said that it would probably happen again because their capacity did not meet patient volume. Um, and he defended his actions in the name of sanitary regulations. Um, so the autopsy confirmed that the death was due to four factors, a premature delivery at eight months, um, a ruptured umbilical cord, a small skull fracture, and quote, the omission of the necessary care, end quote. And that quote is taken directly from criminal legislation on infanticide, that a woman could be found, could be found um, guilty of infanticide if they did not provide the necessary care after the birth and the infant died. And that's a pretty vague quote, right? That could be stretched and expanded um, in many ways. Um, but Vieta is a, a, eventually exonerated. The case doesn't go to trial. The police officer uh, wrote in his final remarks, you know, she wouldn't have gone to the public maternity hospital if she had planned to kill her child. Um, so we don't know what happened to Vieta afterwards, um, but we can get from a really close reading of the case that perhaps the, you know, the police officer believe that Vieta's sexual and reproductive life were not, would lay outside the established norms of proper gendered behavior at that time, which would be um, virginity before marriage and fidelity within it, right? Um, so, you know, I think the shocking example sort of directly responds to some of these questions and issues that have uh, come up so far is that one is the relationship between reproductive rights and high quality healthcare. So Vieta lost a child that she planned on raising because a public hospital turned her away in labor, right? And to compound this tragedy, the police then investigated her for infanticide. Um, it did not investigate the hospital's inaction or action, excuse me. Um, so we can think about this in terms of one, high quality healthcare, she was turned away right in labor. Now we have a law against that in the in the US, I think it's from the 1990s, Dr. Thaxton can um, uh, provide more specific information. Um, but if you don't have high quality healthcare, um, then, reproductive rights are really difficult to achieve, right? Um, the second is the legal structure surrounding reproduction. So, he, you know, in the case I gave, abortion was illegal. Now, this case is not about abortion, but even cases like infanticide, um, which was the intentional killing of a child immediately after birth, even cases like that, you can see that the law can be stretched in ways um, because of a misunderstanding of, of, of pregnancy and childbirth. Um, and so, you know, criminal laws are not efficient in ending practices um, in sort of in response to Dr. Velez. And then the third is just to talk about inequality, right? So we can see from the demographic profile of Isalina um, that she needed to use a public hospital. She was illiterate. Um, so we can make a, a educated assumption that she was from the working or the lower working classes, at least. Um, and that with women who have unequal access, right, to that first healthcare, the state can then really abuse the second, the legality, in a way that women who perhaps have more money or access in the past would not be, um, uh, would not face those same state sort of uh, um, restrictions or, or state oppression in that sense. Um, so, you know, I think the historical example shows that you need a uh, high quality, I would say universal health care. Um, and you also need the decriminalization of abortion for people to have full reproductive rights uh, today. And that historical examples can sort of show if you have one variable or the other variable, what's going on in the lives of women who are seeking out 
uh, pregnancy related care or seeking out abortion, right? So I think I'll, I'll stop it um, there and let other people sort of respond. Yeah, before going on to kind of like the next lightning round of one question for everyone, I wondered, um, Dr. Thaxton or Dr. Gonzalez Velez, um, do you have any responses to these historical examples or thoughts on um, the role that historical analysis can play um, in identifying the ways in which certain groups, especially marginalized populations, are made particularly vulnerable to certain kinds of criminalizations or lack of access to exercising rights that they may or may not be guaranteed, you know, um, uh, legally um, or or hope to have access to. Um, any any responses to this? Yeah, Dr. Thaxton? Or no, Dr. Gonzalez Vélez. No, solamente una cosa muy, muy breve, porque no voy a, no voy ni a repetir ni a hablar de algo que eh, nuestra colega ha explicado con tanta claridad y conocimiento, pero yo sí creo que la agenda de salud reproductiva es una agenda por definición pendular. Eh, en general, lo que nosotros observamos son avances, amenazas, erosiones, y creo que en una agenda con ese movimiento es imposible entenderla en perspectiva si uno no comprende la historia de cómo se han constituido, por ejemplo, las restricciones, de cómo se han construido las políticas, de cómo son las estrategias que se han organizado desde los grupos que se oponen a la protección de estos derechos. Entonces, me parece que... que Indudablemente, y lo que acaba de pasar en Estados Unidos con la decisión de Dobbs es un ejemplo claro de la importancia de entender en perspectiva histórica las decisiones, porque lo que pasó en la Corte Suprema de Estados Unidos no pasó hace dos meses, empezó a pasar hace 50 años, cuando justamente se alcanzó esa conquista en el año 73 y los movimientos en Estados Unidos de alguna manera se, no sé cuál palabra utilizar respetuosamente, pero se desactivaron o silenciaron frente, a, frente al tema del aborto y creo que ese silencio en parte explica en buena medida pues, lo que pasó. Entonces simplemente decir que, que creo como ella que es una perspectiva absolutamente fundamental. Ya, sí, Dr. Ra. I just um, uh, appreciate what Dr. Velez just said and I you know, I have written down here that a historical perspective, I talk about it as waves of criminalization or decriminalization, as Dr. Velez said, a pendulum. Um, and that you just, as we're looking in the past to help build a stronger future, you just, we need to figure out what are the sort of constant variables that expand or contract access to good reproductive health care. So, the, you know, in Brazil, for example, they have universal health care. There's many problems with the system, but overall it's a pretty amazing system and it's, it's, it's available to anyone. I've used, uh, I'm not a Brazilian citizen and I've used their health care system, right? So uh, when Dr. White earlier was talking about migrants don't have access to many systems in the United States, that's not the case in Brazil, but that's not the only thing we have to think about in terms of good reproductive health care. Um, so we also want to talk, think about the law and the legal strictures around it, and of course, um, inequality. Um, and that just tracing those through history, I think, can provide us sort of a, 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 a framework for understanding what we today need to put into place to have a stronger future in relation to this issue, both in the United States or in any other country. Absolutely. So unless Dr. Thaxton wants to jump in on that one in terms of the importance of a historical perspective, we um, also had a question about the role of popular protest. And so this um, connects very much to what Dr. Roth and Dr. Gonzalez Velez were, were um, just mentioning. And so it's a question that I would invite all of you um, three to think about in terms of in your area of research, how has popular protest affected the landscape of reproductive rights? Um, and for Dr. Thaxton in particular, but I know Dr. Gonzalez Velez and Cassia will also have um, thoughts on this. 
when doctors when doctors are stuck in the middle of legislative prohibitions, for example, versus popular demands for things like contraception and access to the termination of pregnancy, how do they navigate that delicate position? Who would like to go first? Okay, Dr. Gonzalez, go ahead. Bueno, varias cosas. Con respecto a la protesta social, pues la, el primer momento en que, en que pensé la pregunta estaba muy concentrada en las últimas protestas sociales que tuvieron lugar en Colombia, donde pues efectivamente la agenda de salud reproductiva no fue la agenda que llevó a una movilización social y yo diría que eh, esos no eran los temas, digamos, que despertaron esa protesta social, aunque aparecieron durante ese periodo de la conversación. Eh, sin embargo, eh, lo que sí hemos visto en América Latina en años recientes es una masiva movilización de las mujeres, las jóvenes y las feministas, también algunos hombres que han acompañado esas movilizaciones masivas en torno a la agenda de igualdad de las mujeres y con un foco muy muy grande en el tema del aborto. Eh, digamos que eh, el ejemplo más grande, pero no el primero, porque esas movilizaciones arrancaron en México, en Uruguay, también después en Argentina. El más grande, decía, pues vino de la experiencia de Argentina con la capacidad, digamos, que tuvieron en este país de transformar un símbolo como era la bandana que se utilizaba en la cabeza por parte de las madres de Plaza de Mayo a un símbolo más moderno que las jóvenes llevan en el puño y que significa no solamente la lucha en las calles por la liberalización del aborto, sino también, como le escuché a unas jóvenes en estos días, una señal, un signo para decir, acá estoy, acá te apoyamos, acá puedes encontrar, digamos, una respuesta. Entonces, me parece que ha sido muy potente y, y menciono el caso de Argentina porque sin esa gran movilización social, la transformación cultural que se logró ahí para alcanzar el apoyo en el debate en el Congreso no hubiera sido posible. Ustedes saben que el proceso en Argentina tuvo dos momentos. En un primer momento no pasó la ley pero nunca se me va a olvidar porque yo estuve en la Asamblea de Diputados presentando el caso de Colombia en ese formato extraño que inventaron en la Argentina, habla una persona a favor, habla una persona en contra. Eh, en ese, ese día de la presentación alguien me dijo al oído lo que empezó a pasar en la Argentina posiblemente no se vea reflejado ahora en un cambio en la ley, pero lo vamos a ver reflejado en muy poco tiempo. Y en efecto, un año y medio después tenían la ley aprobada en la Argentina. Y esa movilización ha sido un telón de fondo muy importante para las otras batallas que hemos dado, porque mostró una especie de fuerza y de simbología que creó una, un, un, un sentido para la, para la lucha y que incluso estoy empezando a ver en los Estados Unidos. Y lo segundo que quisiera comentar es en, en relación al papel de los médicos. Yo creo que cuando estamos frente a prohibiciones legales o bien sea la demanda de atención de anticoncepción o aborto, eh, los profesionales de la salud tenemos mucho para hacer. Y me gustaría señalar tres cosas. Lo primero, organizarnos para el cambio. Yo, nosotros creemos fuertemente que aunque la Corte Constitucional estableció en el caso de Colombia un límite para el procedimiento de aborto que fue la semana 24 y después de esa semana las tres causales, permitiendo que las mujeres puedan decidir basadas en sus propias razones, creemos que hay que seguir insistiendo en la necesidad de eliminar el delito de aborto de los códigos penales, eliminar la conversación del ámbito penal, porque eso va a reducir el estigma y la amenaza permanente en la que vive, digamos, eh, la posibilidad de que las mujeres accedan a un servicio de aborto. Y para esa batalla la voz de médicos y médicas es central en este tipo de conversación, tanto como lo fue en el proceso que hicimos en Causa Justa en Colombia y que nos llevó a esa decisión histórica. Lo segundo es que en Canadá, hace un par de décadas, muchos médicos empezaron a expresar que las prohibiciones de aborto iban en contra del ejercicio eh, con libertad de su profesión y oficio. 
y algunos de ellos incluso prestaron servicios bajo la cláusula de la prestación con compromiso de conciencia, aún contrariando los marcos legales. En Colombia, de hecho, nosotras utilizamos este argumento de la libertad de profesión y oficio como uno de los argumentos de la demanda que le presentamos a la Corte Constitucional y creo que ese papel solo lo pueden jugar los médicos y médicas o profesionales de la salud y por eso me alegra escuchar a la doctora eh, Taxton invitando digamos a unirnos con, con, con Students for Choice eh, y lo tercero que creo que es fundamental es aprender a trabajar en alianzas a los profesionales de la salud nos necesitan trabajando adentro de nuestro gremio, pero también sumando nuestra voz fuera con las feministas, con los defensores de derechos humanos, con los grupos, digamos, en un sentido más amplio. Eh, yo quisiera, por último, aprovechando la pregunta que, que nos pediste responder acerca de la importancia de la perspectiva histórica, Retomar esta idea de, de la agenda pendular o las waves de las que habla la doctora eh, Casi para decir que nosotras en América Latina entendemos este momento histórico como un momento en el que quizá es importante mirar al sur, es importante mirar a las estrategias que nosotras estamos moviendo desde el sur, no solamente en el campo, digamos, legislativo, sino en el ámbito del litigio de alto impacto, pero también nuestras estrategias en comunicación política, en la movilización en calle, en la movilización social de una manera general. Los argumentos que hemos trabajado, cuando nosotras empezamos Causa Justa, nos decían 90 argumentos, es demasiado para un debate público, pero no son 90 argumentos para uno explicar cada vez que habla, sino para convocar más intereses y más personas. Y esos argumentos, por ejemplo, son argumentos muy distintos a los que en su momento utilizó la Corte Suprema de Estados Unidos cuando tomó la decisión de Roe versus Wade. La decisión constitucional de Colombia está anclada en la protección de tres derechos, que son el derecho a la igualdad, el derecho a la salud y el derecho a la libertad de conciencia. La Corte reconoció que el derecho penal era desproporcionado y que creaba barreras que impedían proteger esos tres derechos. Entonces creo que también hay un bagaje importante de aprendizaje y mi mensaje final sería, es un momento para, para mirar al sur, porque además creo que tanto allá como acá enfrentamos lo que yo llamo la batalla cultural de este siglo, que es la batalla por la libertad reproductiva de las mujeres. Everything that you just said was so inspiring and um, invigorating. I couldn't agree more with um, the messages that you gave us in terms of looking towards the South, listening you know, to the lessons that have been built over the course of decades and decades of grassroots activism that's culminating as you, um, as you already explained you know, in these, these cultural movements um, that, are, that are not silent, that are very loud and Um, sorry, I'm <laughs> just kind of um, reflecting on everything you just said. Dr. Thaxton, would you like to, to add on to this? Um, do you have anything, anything to share um, about the importance of popular movements that you didn't touch on already in your responses to other questions or, or anything you'd like to add? I, mean, I, am, uh, I also loved everything you said. I, I guess one thing that when you talked about popular movements that I thought of from my lens as a physician is the increase in physician advocacy specifically with um, reproductive rights, but also um, we saw more physician advocacy with the pandemic, with climate change, you know, water safety. Um, I think in my time as a physician, we've seen more um, physician advocacy in these roles. And I think that we have such an opportunity to provide insight that not everybody has because not everybody experiences a complicated pregnancy um and or um an abortion or you know we just we um have a vantage point that i think not everybody um has when we think about these policies um that affect health care um 
And so um, I think tapping into those stories is an opportunity um, for popular movement resistance um, and uh, an advocacy for change. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Thaxton, you know, what you just said made me reflect on some statements that I've seen, for example, um, you know, from from um, uh, groups of doctors that recognize um, the how healthcare institutions are also inter intertwined with, for example, policing institutions. Um, which, you know, it reminds me of um, Cassia's comments on the history of how the criminalization of the reproductive acts of marginalized and racialized and impoverished women, um, you know, is part of this, uh, this history, right? Um, and um, so when you were naming like, you know, all the things that that doctor uh, associations have been speaking out about you know um, police violence against um, communities is is definitely one of the ones that I've been um, seeing um, gain a lot of traction in the last couple of years as well. Um, let's see. So now we have time for questions from the audience. I have not seen any yet, but um, I would invite anyone you know to share your thoughts or your questions you can share through the Q&A button. And if you have access to the chat, you could also do that. Or if you're watching on Facebook, then you can um, type in the live chat on Facebook. Do any of you, Dr. Roth, um, Dr. Gonzalez Velez, or Dr. Thaxton have questions for each other or um, additional comments that you'd like to share? Can I make a, fine, a comment about what you said? I'm sorry. Absolutely, please do. Un comentario muy pequeño sobre la, la, el vínculo entre las instituciones de salud y la policía. Nosotras en el proceso del movimiento Causa Justa en Colombia hicimos un estudio sobre la criminalización del aborto en Colombia y revisamos todos los casos que habían llegado a la Fiscalía General de la Nación desde que se despenalizó el aborto. Y observamos dos cosas muy importantes. Primero, un incremento en la denuncia y la criminalización. En el momento en que el aborto deja de estar totalmente penalizado, crece la criminalización. Y en efecto, una gran mayoría de las denuncias de los casos de aborto se originan en las instituciones de salud, como ustedes han mencionado, pero lo que quiero señalar es la eficacia de esa denuncia, porque 53% de las condenas por aborto consentido en Colombia fueron el producto de denuncias hechas por médicos en los hospitales. Eh, lo que quiere decir que cuando un médico denuncia, esa denuncia es alta es seriamente tomada por la justicia y el efecto en términos de la condena es gigantesca. Go ahead, Dr. Roth. So I have um, just some outside noise. I don't know if other people can hear it. Um, but okay, I wanted to um, build upon what um, Dr. Vélez said because as I was just thinking earlier about the role of physicians uh, protesting in favor of reproductive rights, um, what I've seen in Brazil, and I'm making here some generalizations, right? Um, but historically, the law in Brazil has targeted providers and not women for, um, so they've, tar they've targeted abortion providers, which has pushed the provision of abortion care um, into illegal corners where it's not as safe. Um, and it has also sort of incentivized physician-based denunciations, um, as Dr. Velez was saying, that are that the law takes more seriously. Um, and I'll also say that you know overall the medical profession in Brazil is pretty conservative and paternalistic. There's not a lot of patient um, dialogue, or, or and so you know I think that the role of physicians is of course in the protests is important, but also someone like you, um, Elizabeth, who's teaching 
soon to be physicians and physicians across in many countries need to actually be learning some of this historical evidence or some of these these trends because if we need to change some not change but we need to uh, you know demonstrate other aspects other worldviews so that there is more patient centered care in that sense um and i'll just want to say that in brazil um popular protest has been so important and i i um recently with a a co-author of mine we interviewed se several um important feminists who were working in the 1980s to decriminalize abortion and i think one of the things you know they didn't they didn't manage to decriminalize abortion in the 1980s, but they also stopped the um, constitutional uh, 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 the constitutionalization of fetal rights from the moment of conception, which is no small feat, right? And so we we also want to think about that popular protest goes up against sometimes a very organized um, in in many countries religious right, and so not all uh, successes are necessarily the, the decriminalization of abortion, right? But that they can be setting the stage for future um, expansion of reproductive rights. Elizabeth, I, I have a question if, if you allow me. Please and go ahead. In many, in many countries we see these political pendants, like switching between right and the left. And I wonder if everything that we accomplish in the country can be lost in the next minute when the government change or there's maybe beyond these political switches there's a great an understanding from society that these are rights they are have to stay here regardless of who is in the the government turn do you feel optimistic about that do you think that every turn of government we have to be going back and forth to having this discussion for the future it could be from latin america or from us the answer I, I'll just say briefly, I think, um, you know, changing hearts and minds is harder than uh, changing culture and changing people's opinions is harder than, um, well, I don't know if it's harder, but it's pretty difficult than changing a law, right? Um, and I think that in the US, we have some pretty undemocratic institutions that allow for minority opinion to become majority rule. Um, and so we have to take a, a look at the foundations of what we want our democracy to look like because you're always going to have differing opinions on some of these issues and that's fine everyone should be able to um have their specific worldviews and practice what they want to in their personal lives but when the minority opinion becomes the majority rule then you have to look and say well something's wrong here yeah i would just add on to that, that I feel like from a US perspective, but also a global perspective that pendulum has the opportunity to swing specific to reproductive rights um, more so um, whenever there are a minority of pregnancy capable people in positions of power to make those decisions. Yo quisiera agregar una cosa muy, perdón, quisiera agregar algo muy pequeño y es, yo creo que la pregunta aquí es, ¿qué hace sostenibles las decisiones en materia de políticas de salud reproductiva y en particular sobre aborto? Por supuesto que la orientación del gobierno es siempre una amenaza. Eh, nosotras lo hemos visto pues en Centroamérica, los cambios que se dieron que llevaron a la sobrepenalización del aborto porque ya ni siquiera está penalizado, está overcriminalized eh, y el, el, las penas son más grandes que cualquier delito de lesa humanidad, penas de 50 años por una pérdida en el embarazo. Um, y creo que aquí hay varias cosas. La primera es construir legitimidad frente a las decisiones de las mujeres. Yo creo que crear entornos de legitimidad para explicarle a la sociedad que el punto aquí no es si las mujeres abortan o no, sino que el aborto no es obligatorio y que además el punto es poder respetar las decisiones íntimas de cada persona. Es una tarea que hay que hacer, aunque es difícil. Yo coincido con la doctora Roth en que cambiar la cabeza y el corazón es lo más difícil pero es lo que asegura la sostenibilidad y por eso creo que estamos en esta batalla. 
creo que depende también del tipo de decisión. No es lo mismo una ley que una decisión judicial. Cambiar una decisión judicial suele ser más difícil, pero tampoco es garantía y lo que acaba de pasar en Estados Unidos nos lo muestra claramente. Y yo creo que un, te, un camino que nosotras empezamos a abrir y ya instalamos en la región es la crítica al uso del derecho penal. Yo creo que si logramos sacar el aborto y cualquier servicio de salud reproductiva del ámbito penal, vamos a hacer más sostenibles los cambios. No, no estoy diciendo que van a desaparecer las barreras, porque este es un tema que genera controversias y que genera tensiones, pero por lo menos... Eh, hace más digna la vida pues, de las mujeres. I love how you said that, Doctora González Vélez, um, with emphasis on um, dignity and decriminalization. You um, mentioned the what you call the extreme overcriminalization um, of reproductive health situations in Guatemala, where we, you know, we see literally thousands, uh, not not just Guatemala, you said Central America, El Salvador, Honduras, see, um, you know, uh, literally thousands of women um, and childbearing people who, um, who have been imprisoned after um, having had gone into labor early and almost having a miscarriage, but in which the child even survived. And, you know, so I want to, um, you know, give a big shout out um, as Cassia did, you know, uh, to the activists that have been working on these things since the 1970s, since the 1980s in Mexico. Um, since I study the history of these questions in Mexico, there's um, a group. It's called Grupo de Información sobre Reproducción Elegida, y yo creo que um, I think that they um, agree with what you were saying, um, Doctora González Vélez, uh, about taking um, the realm of reproduction out of the sphere of criminalization to the degree that even though they oppose many practices of um, non-consented sterilization and obstetric violence, they also do not think that individual practitioners should be criminalized for those things because they see the prevention of these kinds of violences against childbearing people as the responsibility of the state. And any refusal to do that is state, you know, um, a broad umbrella of state violence against um, the dignity of, of whole groups of people. And so it's kind of, you know, like with the historical example that Cassia gave, for example, you know, in a situation in which maybe the health, you know, um, care um, funcionario or official or employee was afraid that he was going or that the, ho that the hospital was going to be criminalized for the child having died. And so what did they do? They tried to criminalize and pathologize and discriminate against the individual woman instead. Um, and so whenever you pit healthcare systems against individual people who are just living their reproductive lives, then I think that, you know, we can see um, these situations that, you know, we've, we've shed a lot of light historical and policy based and medical based on today. Um, special thanks, you know, to, to Paloma again and Doctora um, Pineda for, for organizing this and giving us the space to have these conversations. There's so, so, so much more that could have been said. And again, Doctora Gonzalez Velez, enormous congratulations. You said that you were there in the Senate, you know, arguing um, for the passage of this law um, that you succeeded in, um, in Colombia. So we'll be looking, as you said, looking to the South. Um, to South America, to the global South, and being inspired by the grassroots movements and legal strategies and feminist activism that we see coming out um, of that region and connecting right to the reproductive justice movement and um, you know other social movements that have long been um, fighting for dignity and justice in these realms. Any other closing comments or thoughts? I'll just say very briefly on a note of. Um... You know, a positive note that I think one thing we're seeing uh, that's based on this idea of grassroots organizing in the U.S. Um, is the organization of abortion funds, right? So um, this sort of crowdsourcing of help, and that also is the case in Brazil. Um, I that's the only sort of context I know it in, but that you know there are things that are happening um, that are a step in the in the right direction, and so uh, we can look to those for. Uh, some sort of energy moving forward. And Doctora Gloria Gonzalez Lopez, um, huge saludos to you, Doctora. You said un gran abrazo a todas. Um, aquí estamos y somos muchas. Um, coincido. So thank you for that. Other thoughts, comments, 
Thank you, you so much for having me. Elizabeth, by the way, you were superb keeping the thread of this conversation. Thanks. Well, well. <laughs> it was a big, um, I was very nervous about it, but I'm, I'm so honored to be back in the last, it's my intellectual home. It's where I was formed as a scholar. And I'm so, so, so grateful for this opportunity to be in conversation with these scholars who I so admire. And so thank you very much. Thank Thanks you, so